Well, this is an exciting Sunday for us. This is a baptism and membership Sunday. This is not a new piece of architecture. This is a temporary installment with ice cold water. No, it's, it's been heated um, for a couple of people who will be baptized today to give public testimony of what God has done in them through the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know some of you are visiting here this morning to witness this exciting moment. We're glad that you're here. Some of you are live streaming to see uh, family members be baptized. Uh, We're excited that you're joining us in that way as well. We're also today uh, welcoming approximately 20 people to membership at Grace Bible Church. And that is just a thrill to see an intentional commitment to the local body of believers. And this is just an exciting Sunday for us to do all of that. I want to have you open your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, and Hebrews is that New Testament book with an Old Testament sounding name, so turn to the right in your Bible, Hebrews chapter 10, and what I want to do this morning is look at the work of Christ compared to the priestly work of the Old Testament sacrificial system. And contrast what the finished work of Christ means for us who believe. And this is going to give us a backdrop to understand a little bit about what is happening or what has already happened for those who are being baptized today. So as a backdrop to baptism this morning, we're going to take a a rather brief look at Hebrews chapter 10 verses 10 to 14. And admittedly, we're parachuting into what is perhaps foreign territory here. Uh, We're jumping into the middle of a verse, in the middle of a chapter, in the middle of a letter uh, that we have not been studying consecutively. So there are some significant disadvantages for us in doing this, and, and I cannot develop all of the background and the context for us here. But let me just summarize by saying that the point of the letter to the Hebrews... This book of Hebrews in your Bible, it was a letter written pastorally, maybe even sermonically, to Jews living in Jerusalem who had begun to follow Jesus as Messiah. And that presented a particular challenge for them. There was a cost of discipleship in a Jew in Jerusalem following Jesus as Messiah, and there was a particular temptation to slide back into that which had been comfortable, cultural, familial as Jews. And the book of Hebrews was written prior to the destruction of the temple in AD AD 70 by Titus Vespasian, where he leveled the temple to a flat space that you can go now and see in Jerusalem. It completely took the temple apart. Well, this letter was written prior to the temple's demolition. And this was Herod's temple, the temple that Herod built, the temple that was around in Jesus' day. It was magnificent and beautiful and monumental. And if you were a Jew living in the first century prior to the temple's destruction, having begun to follow Jesus the Messiah, you were now following one who was born under scandalous circumstances who claimed to be Messiah, who claimed to be God in the flesh, who claimed to be able to forgive sin. And meanwhile, the entire establishment of religious leadership had rejected him as a fraud. And now this Jesus is gone. And many believed in him who had not seen him And so they rested in faith on someone that they could not see, someone to whom the Scriptures gave ample testimony. But there was nothing tangible for them to hold on to. Contrast that to the big box that stood in the middle of the city on the highest hill, that temple. And before it was destroyed, the sacrificial system kept going. Long after Ichabod was cried, long after the glory of the Lord had left the temple, long after the Lord himself had come and visited the temple and called it out for its hypocrisy, for its oppression, for its brutality over God's people, for its lack of pointing to the one to whom the temple itself was to be a foreshadow. 
And in rejecting Messiah, this building was now empty of the glory of God, empty of the truth of God, and as it stood with its sacrifices that at one point had been ordained by God as good to foreshadow the work of Christ. Those operations kept going, and the priests kept slaughtering a parade of sacrificial animals set for slaughter. And the perpetual sacrifices kept going, but, but now instead of being able to point forward to the one to whom they were foreshadowing, they were derelict of meaning. They were obsolete. And the point of the letter to the Hebrews is, Jewish Christian, you have followed the correct Messiah. You have followed the one, Hebrews 1, whom God himself told the angels in heaven to worship. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the Levitical priesthood. Jesus is better than everything you'd be tempted to go back to. A Jewish Christian, don't leave the only sacrifice for sin to cave under societal pressure and go back to what you can see and taste and feel and smell. Listen, the sacrifice is still operated, which means that parade, that perpetual parade of sacrificial animals into the temple went up in smoke and out in blood day after day after day through that box in the center of town. Could you imagine being a Jew in the first century, having followed Christ, who is now gone, invisible, intangible, and being tempted every day by your family, come back, come back. You're rejecting Judaism, and a Christian who was Jewish, who followed Christ, was not rejecting the Old Testament, <laughs> but was seen to be rejecting the Old Testament, the traditions, the leadership, the family, the society, the culture, was seen as a sellout and a heretic, a follower of a fraud. And every day the city would smell of the stench of sacrifice and the blood of the sacrificial animals would spill out of the temple complex down the hill into the valley. Every day a reminder that, look, there, that's how you take care of your sin. You go, and you go, and you go, and the priest sacrifices and sacrifices an animal after animal dies. And that's how you take care of sin. When all of those things were pointing to one final sacrifice. And the temptation for a Jewish Christian was to leave Jesus and go back to what was tangible <laughs> because to have walked away from the traditions was now to be rejected by my people. Maybe to lose my livelihood. Maybe to have my possessions plundered. But leaving Jesus would mean leaving everything. Life. True forgiveness of sin. And missing God himself. So we're going to parachute into this little section in Hebrews 10. And the author writes this. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all time. We have been sanctified. This is a once-for-all-time event. This is positional sanctification if you've got your theological ears on. This is a once and for all setting apart unto God of believers by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And the faith in Jesus Christ is about the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. And then this last little phrase in verse 10 in English says once for all. It is one word that means once for all time. Or we say in English sometimes once and for all. It's not once for all people. It's once and for all time. It's done. One sacrifice. And the work is finished. This setting apart unto God of people who have faith in the finished work of Christ. Verse 11, by contrast, every priest stands daily ministering and offering 
And both of these verbs here stress the ongoing nature of these activities. And you get the ongoing nature of these activities ad nauseum in the piling up of language here. They are daily, ongoingly ministering and in an ongoing way offering and then time after time the same sacrifices. You feel the laborious nature in the language of this verse of what is going on over and over and over and over again. And notice the last phrase, they can never take away sins. They can never take away sins. All of those operations, all of that mechanization, all of the priestly labor, all of the blood spilt, and all of this ordained by God as good under Mosaic law for a purpose and for a time. The time has expired, the purpose has gone away, and the sacrifices are now obsolete. And the priests who slaughter the animals for forgiveness of sin are the priests who have rejected the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by going on with the priestly sacrifices in the temple, they pile up their guilt and culpability, not only for themselves, but making disciples of themselves and leading other people away from true forgiveness. This is, by the way, the hamster wheel of human religion and whatever other form it might take, a rejection of Christ and the pursuit of operations and things that must be done and ceremonies and other sacrifices in order to get my forgiveness. It's contrary to what Ashley Anderson shared during communion, the free gift of God through Christ, procured by faith and by faith alone. Every priest stands daily ministering. They can't take away sins. Contrast verse 12, but he, that is Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down. He sat down. Do you notice the difference? Those priests going on ministering all the time, they are standing and standing and standing and working. And one priest does his nine to five, punches out, shift over. Next priest comes, he's still standing. And when those priests die, other priests have to take their place. And it just keeps going. By contrast, Jesus Christ came, laid his life down as the sacrifice, and then sat down at the right hand of the Father. And here the writer to Hebrews picks up Psalm 110, a phenomenal Christological psalm, describing what it would mean for Jesus to give himself as a sacrifice and to sit at the power and the authority of the right hand of God and wait And this Jesus who laid his life down as a sacrifice, even now, even today, waits for something, according to Psalm 110. He waits for the subjugation of his enemies to be placed under his feet as a footstool. So even right now, at the right hand of the Father, yes, Jesus is making intercession on behalf of believers on the basis of his blood spilt at Calvary, and he waits. He waits for the day when the kingdom will be his, and even his enemies will feign obedience to him as he rules the nations with a rod of iron. That day is coming, and for that day he waits. But in terms of his substitutionary sacrifice on behalf of sin, he cried out on the cross, it is finished, and then he sat down. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, until A.D. 70, those priests stood And they kept doing sacrifices. And they kept doing sacrifices. And they kept shedding blood in an obsolete system that could not deal with sin. Look at verse 14. For by one offering, one offering, Jesus went to the cross, died on the cross, one time for all time. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. I emphasize some words to try to bring out some nuanced verb tenses that you need to understand in this verse. I'll fill these out a little bit, but this verse explains for us what has happened to Emma Cottrell 
and Karis James. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, by faith, that they are about to give testimony to and tell all of us here today what God has done for them by his grace. This verse explains their story. For by one offering, Jesus has perfected. That means he has completed and totally done and finished the work that was required for them to meet God and not be incinerated. God's standard is perfection. His holiness and his justice demand absolute obedience and conformity to his will and to his word. And listen, some of you know Emma. That has not been her story. And some of you know Karis, and some closer than others. And you know that has not been her story. No one who is a Christian is perfect in the sight of God based on anything they have ever done. Quite the contrary. We humans have only accrued guilt upon guilt upon guilt for who we are emanating forth in what we do. At the outward behavior level that other people can see, at the inward motive level that other people can't see, at the thoughts and the attentions of the hearts that God sees right through, we are guilty. And there's no hope in some sort of religious activity or ceremony or pulling yourself up by your own moral bootstraps or cleaning up your life that you could ever undo the fundamental problem with humanity. But God does. As a free gift by his love on the basis of faith for all who believe in this perfective, finished work. Notice what he says, by one offering, that one offering for all time, Jesus has perfected for all time. That is, what Jesus does in his offering for those who belong to him is grant by grace the standard of perfection that God demands. And others have said it well, God is willing to see you as if you had never sinned and to have seen Jesus on the cross as if he committed all of your sins. And so believers in Jesus walk away with a verdict of not guilty, but not just not guilty, but positively righteous. A staggering reality. And notice what he says about them. By one offering, Jesus has perfected for all time some people. And what does he say about these people? Those who are being sanctified. Those who are being sanctified. Really remarkable statement here. This isn't the positional sanctification we saw above in verse 10. This is a progressive, ongoing set apartification that is the substance of the Christian life. And so when you hear Emma Cottrell and Karis James be baptized, you're not seeing people who have nailed it and fixed everything and are now therefore perfect. Oh, they've been declared perfect by God in the courtroom of heaven, purchased by the blood of Christ and imputed his righteousness. But they'll sin. You'll see them sin. You'll know that they sin, just like every Christian sins, but something is happening and it defines the Christian life. They are those who are being sanctified. They are those who, by the power of the Spirit of God, are being progressively conformed into Christ-likeness in increasing measure. And friend, when you are a new creature and you are born again, you are given resources you could not know before you were in Christ. And you see the work of God in you, transforming you from the inside out. And the irony is you begin to sin less, but you hate sin more. And you feel this tension, which is the Christian life. And God is faithful to cause his people to be conformed to the image of his son in progress in the Christian life. Because that is the end goal that he has for your life, Christian. Romans 8, 29 to be conformed to the image of Christ in glory. That day's coming. And so what you get to hear in the next few moments is two believers 
boasting in their Savior, talking about the fact that they are ones who are being sanctified, but because of their faith in Jesus Christ, they already have been declared perfect. The work of Christ, the perfect finished work of Christ has been done on their behalf. And they're not here because they figured it out one day and cleaned themselves up and got everything right. They are here by God's grace. And they want to tell you about that. So Emma, come on up and tell us how God's grace has infiltrated your life. Good morning. My name is Emma Cottrell, and I want to tell you about the amazing things my Savior has done for me. I was raised in a Christian home and regularly attended church. I grew up hearing Bible stories, attending various youth groups, and regularly hearing the gospel preached to me. I remember raising my hand in youth group to say that I had accepted Christ into my heart at a very young age. I had no idea what I was doing or what it meant, and really did not accept Christ until much later. I remember being about 12 or 13 when I recognized sin in my life and prayed desperately in repentance for God's forgiveness. But in my depravity, I allowed my focus to be taken from God as my savior and instead lived as if I no longer had a care. In my mind, I was safe. Fast forward to only a couple of years ago when I entered into a season of difficulty and unhappiness. I became very discontent with my life and sought to change it all and not in a way that would glorify the Lord. But God, in his great mercy and grace, took a hold of my heart and drew me in. At the age of 19, I finally realized how extremely sinful and selfish the desires of my heart were. I had sought only to glorify myself and gave little care for the people around me, including my own family. I was deeply grieved and felt completely hopeless, unsure of what to do next. The words from a verse I had once memorized spun through my head. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. But how could that be? Me, the person who had overlooked her creator and savior and his numerous blessings, the person who, despite knowing the truth, ignored it for personal gain. Jesus endured death on a cross and separation from his father for me. Since that day, I have given my life over completely to my Lord and savior, The Holy Spirit is in constant battle within my heart against my sinful flesh. But my prayer today and always is that the will of God be carried out in my life, that through me his light shines and my life is a testimony of his unfailing love. I pray I regularly recall my need for a savior and praise with all thankfulness that very savior who gave himself as a ransom for me. I am here today to be baptized in obedience to God's command for those who have put their trust in him. And as a symbol of the newness of life, I now have in him. Emma. In keeping with your profession of faith in Jesus and your desire to obey him in baptism, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Karis James, would you come boast in your Savior? I'm 15 years old. I was born into a Christian family and have been going to church my entire life. I have always known that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I believed that everything in the Bible was true. I always followed all of the rules, but not because I wanted to honor or give glory to God, but because it was what was expected of me, and I didn't want to get in trouble. Like I said, I have always believed that the Bible is true, but I never really understood what it meant to truly be a Christian, and I wasn't ready to devote my life to Christ. For the longest time, whenever someone would ask me if I was a Christian, my answer is simply, I don't know. 
I loved my sin and I didn't want to give it up. I loved myself more than anybody else. I was more concerned with getting my own way rather than pleasing God and loving the people around me. Like Ephesians 2, 1 says, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. When I got into sixth grade and started attending student ministries, it was, a really, it was really convicting for me, and the teaching got me to think deeper about my relationship with the Lord and what being a Christian really meant. All through junior high and maybe even the beginning of high school, I knew that being a Christian was something that I eventually wanted but didn't do anything to act on that. I don't remember a specific day or time that I became a Christian, but what I do know is that I was a sinner. I deserved punishment, but God is rich in mercy and chose to send his son Jesus as a substitute for the death that I deserved. John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Right around sophomore year is when I made the decision that I really wanted to be a Christian and dedicate my life to Christ. Now, I hate my sin, and I see a need to ask God to forgive me for my sin. Even though I am a Christian, it does not mean that I will stop sinning. I will still sin, and I will need to seek forgiveness from the person I sinned against and from God. I now have the ability to fight against my sin with the help of God, whereas before I was saved, I could do nothing but sin. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So the reason I am here in front of you today is to proclaim that I am a follower of Jesus and to tell you the story of how God saved me. It's not a story about me, but a story of what God has done in my life. Karis James, in keeping with your profession of faith in Jesus and your desire to obey him in baptism, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for these two. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your undeserved grace, your kindness on display, and for producing these trophies of your love. God, we're humbled as we think about our own new birth. Those of us who know you, these bring back memories of what it was to live without you and then all of a sudden to know you personally to be transformed, to be given new desires, uh, to be all of a sudden walking on a new path. And we thank you for these clear testimonies and we ask that you would strengthen them both, encourage them both, even as they have been bold and courageous with the gospel here today before a watching world. We pray that you would use them every step and every day of their lives uh, to make you known, to make the gospel known. And God, would you be pleased to draw many people to yourself through them. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.